everybody and welcome to the drunken ux podcast we are so glad that you could be here today and we know that you've survived the cold and dug yourself <laughs> out of your snow and at least i i don't know aaron are you uh still snowed in uh we're not too bad on we actually didn't get much snow but it's it's pretty cold it's around right around zero right now it, it we got single digits here and uh the other day i, I ran our fireplace all through the day, but now my house, like, it smells, it's got that smoky <laughs> smell to it, you know? You can only I, get I like that wood smell. burning fireplace. Right. Well, you are listening to the Drunken UX Podcast. This is episode number 29 for, what, February 4th, I guess, is the day. Uh, we are going to be talking about form usability and form UX. So that'll be a fun little time. I am your... Bearded and occasionally silly host, Michael Feenan. <laughs> We're other host who has less beard and more silliness, Aaron. <laughs> but we've got a solution to this because we decided, well, I'm just going to cut off about four inches of mine and mail it to Aaron. And he's going to spirit gum it <laughs> oh onto his face. Oh, I think they did an episode so... of Jackass like that once, didn't they? It's so sad. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> This week's episode of the Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at New Cloud. You can check them out at newcloud.com slash drunken UX. That's in ucloud.com slash drunken UX. They do interactive maps and, and, and uh, they uh, do illustrations and have a whole platform. It's very cool. Go check them out uh, and thank them for maps. supporting us. Go, go find us in places. The socials. We have social, social place. The social links. The facebook.com slash drunken UX. And Twitter. Dot com slash drunken ux and then to mix it up drunken ux.com slash slack and then to really confuse you instagram.com slash drunken ux podcast and as you say that it reminds me i need to take a drink of my i have to take a picture of my, <laughs> my god i oh. i swear to god i'm not drunk at this point in in the game oh. i'm just really bad with words apparently Take a drink of my picture. Take a drink of my picture. That's what we're doing on this this game. At any rate, uh, I am <laughs> drinking a glass of Jura. It's a single malt off the Isle of Jura. Uh, hmm. Is in fact the only distillery on the Isle of Jura. Is that a small island? It is a small island Scotch, uh, north of the uh, where like the Isla Scotches get made. If my geography is remembering correctly, this is just the ten year. It's a base bottling. I haven't had it before. This is I opened it up just for the show, and so I'm getting my first tastes of it tonight. It's interesting. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a got a little bit of a peat flavor to it. Um, it's got that kind of smokiness to it, but without the it doesn't have the iodine-y flavor that Isla Scotches have. So, like, okay. your Ardbeg or Lafroy, they've got a very strong iodine component huh. to them. This doesn't have that. It actually has a very rubbery smell to it, though. Like that <laughs> like that heavy, organic rubber kind of uh, scent to it. Very chocolatey. Oh. Um, it's finished in sherry casks, so it's got a sweetness. It's a very, like... It's a very bearded dude kind of scotch, is the way I would say, because it's <laughs> it's just got this very like throaty, strong flavor okay. to it. Um, not bad. It's it's definitely not bad. Um, I've thrown a little bit of water in this glass just to kind of open it up and see <laughs> how it changes. But yeah, I think I'd buy it again. It's it's not bad. I have a dark and stormy made oh. with a uh, kraken and also Ithaca ginger beer from the Ithaca. Oh, Ithaca Beer slash Soda Company. Do you guys have a distillery up there? We do. Well, they have a brewery for the beer, um, and they happen to also make both ginger beer and root beer at the same place. And they're really good. They're they're comparable. They're not as good or as strong as Reed's, if you like Reed's ginger beer, like with the real strong ginger flavor. But um, they, they taste more like real ginger beer than like a... A Seagram's or a Canada Dry Wood, which are just kind of like ginger syrup or something. 
So yeah, those are good. We do have a bunch of distilleries up here, though. There's a few right outside of Ithaca that make um, pretty decent whiskeys and rice. Uh, I think a couple of them make vodka. I think one of them makes gin, too. So. Yeah, so you guys have got like a whole thing going on. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are literally companies that will limo you around to the various wineries on like a wine tour so you don't have to drive. Wow. Yeah. Kicking things off, I want to go back actually to last year. Um, and I saw some stuff about this when it originally came out, and it was interesting, and I remember reading about it. And, and I was doing some research on some other stuff uh, earlier this week. And this article came up again, and I'd forgotten about it, and I thought, that's a cool thing that I don't think a lot of people think about. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of, you know, we we talk a lot about tracking users um, mm -hmm. between uh, privacy laws and GDPR and cookie compliance and all these things. Tracking is on everybody's mind, um, but we always think of it in the context of JavaScript and not mm -hmm. CSS. Yeah. So there's this article, um, it's by Mikey Wills over at Templar Bit, and he's referencing some uh, work by some other folks, this idea that you can write Java, or write CSS that can work kind of like JavaScript in that it can react to things the user is doing on the page and mm -hmm. send information somewhere else about what they're doing. <laughs> um, and it's it's kind of fascinating, really. Oh, that reminds me of, remember how a um, long time ago, before CSS even, you would have that tracking, I think they still do this, the tracking pixel, yeah, where yeah. it's 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 loaded as an image tag, but it's not actually loading image data. Um, I saw I saw a similar one where it was, it was an animated Jif, but it was, um, the, the data was being sent from the server and it effectively acted like an open socket. And you could you could pump data down to the user via that because it would never actually finish loading the Jif. And so this works very. I mean, it's basically using that idea, right? In mm -hmm. that it uses it's exploiting, for lack of a better term, the the URL function in CSS. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's used the URL fun function at this point. Oh yeah. We always use it for, you know, any kind of background images mm -hmm. is real common. Um, fonts, any kind of loading fonts, uh -huh. um, web fonts and things like that. So, you know, we, we use the URL function regularly, but the context we normally think of it in is not something that is interactive. It's just, here's that image file. The trick that they've come up with is by utilizing before and after pseudo selectors. Okay they can bind content because the URL function can work in areas that aren't just like background image. Right. So what they've done is they say, well, we're going to include content because you could, uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll use the, the, the content and an after tag or something like that to insert an image, you know, into okay. for uh, lack of a better example, form validation, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and, in uh, in this context, what they do is they actually point the URL at a script and okay. append data to that URL. Okay. Now the server is getting a log of that data. What are the kinds of things you would track with this? Like uh, which fields they fill out or? So the example is super cool because it's whatever you think it is, it's more. <laughs> there And if you're interested in looking into any of this, We'll have some links. There's a proof of concept uh, called the Crooked Style Sheets. And it's full of examples of, of how you can go about doing this. It's it's by uh, JB Tronics on GitHub. And the way they've set it up is like, how about tracking link clicks? So you okay. click a link, and it loads in the active state. So before you finished clicking on the link, it right. loads content after it that says track this as an action that this link was clicked. <laughs> um, the wild one, the, the where things got, because I hadn't thought about this and it had been a long time since I'd looked at it. They used, you know, you've have you seen uh, function queries, feature queries, sorry. Yes. Wait, so, wait, media queries? Media queries, but for features. Okay, no, I don't think I've seen that. So in CSS now, we have feature queries. So you okay. can, just like with a media query where you say, you know, is the user's screen this big by this big, you know, or you sure. know, at least this wide or something like that. 
you can now do things like, does it support display grid? Oh, okay. Okay. And if it comes back true, then it will run the CSS inside that, that feature uh. query. So, if you know a feature that is or is not running, or in this case is, the, the not, there's a thing about a not condition, but if you know a feature is supported, you can now determine things like what browser are they running? What right. version of that browser are they running? Oh, I see. They're using at supports. And yeah. They have the, the properties. I see it. Because, huh. you know, the adoption of properties is kind of like measuring the rings of a tree. You know, as you go, right. you can right. go back in time and there's less stuff supported by older versions. So you can see as new things get added, you can use that as a gatekeeper to figure out which version <laughs> it's on. So you can send browser data. The server still gets all the normal request headers, so you can still get their IP, you can still get their user agent, and things like that. The, <laughs> the cool example of this, and when I was reading about it, I'm like, I don't, I, I'm trying to think, how would I do that? Time on page. If you aren't running okay. JavaScript, how do you know how long they've been on the page? Yeah. And the answer to that is using keyframes. So because you can do CSS animations now oh. and you can set up keyframes that run, you can bind a keyframe to a call to your tracking URL and ping it on the keyframe loading. You just have to, you know, you would have to, it'd be like a tape measure. There would be a point where it would have to reset. But right. you could make it. You could make it a really long tape measure, and let it ping through that and measure how you figure, people get. If you're, if you know, 90, 90 or ninety five percent of your users are done on your page in say five minutes, then just set it for five minutes. Yeah, and then anything outside of that's going to be a long tail. It it's kind of spooky when you think about it. That yeah, uh, because it gives people a back door into knowing you know, and with as concerned as folks are getting with privacy and things like that. Uh, you know, it's not good enough to just turn off JavaScript or to say, don't track me. Like a lot of browsers now, they're implementing the do not track features mm -hmm. um, that will turn off tracking. Yeah, and this disabling JavaScript that. wouldn't stop. Disabling this... JavaScript would stop it too. Yeah, yeah, there's not really, the only thing you can do is disable CSS. Right. And nobody is going to turn off CSS on websites in their browser because the the Sites are already probably unusable without JavaScript, but mm -hmm. without CSS, they're going to be right. a disaster. Because <laughs> this is basically a, another version of another exploit that came out. What? Okay. About that same time last year, wasn't it? Uh, it was similar. Are you talking about the um, the CSS keylogger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that was like a month before it. Um, it was uh, Chris Croyer, Croyer or Cloyer? Coyer. Coyer. Chris Coyer. Sorry, he, he Chris. Posted, <laughs> he posted an article uh, referring to another thing about how you can use, in the CSS pseudo selectors, you can do like the bracketed um, kind of subqueries. And so you can use or value dollar sign equals, which means that if the, um, if the, the thing on the right hand side of the equal sign is at the end of the string in the values, then it will. Uh, match that when they're typing something into a field like a username or whatever uh, oh it's a value dollar sign equals and then quotes and then the character and so you have 26 or 36 if you want numbers to 26 different um, instances of this and each one of them uses a background image tag with the url and it says you know the local host or whatever slash the letter so value dollar sign equals a background image url localhost slash a Except instead of localhost, you would use whatever your capture set. Yeah, wherever is. your your honey, not honeypot, but yeah. And then then you just check, you just write a log parser to parse your logs and look for these requests as they're coming in. And then you have whatever people are typing. And keeping in mind the same what we were just saying with the uh, with the other tracking, if you're requesting those images and whatnot from this remote server, they're getting your remote IP. So they right. can glue all this data back together on their side. So all of these individual quick hitter um, dings that they're getting can get glommed into usable, very clear right. information. And so, I mean, you wouldn't do this to your own users, I would think. But if an attacker managed to get this into your CSS file or something, how, how soon before you're going to notice that? 
if you don't have like basic changes being tracked man or um yeah that's really the thing right is how do you catch that <laughs> I, d I don't yeah. know what the answer is to that honestly without like physically checking your style sheets regularly you'd have to just i mean if you use git just have to check your git diffs but really so here's and the article that uh that mikey had um gets into a lot of this which is there are ways to protect your yourself and your site because the mm -hmm. the argument is not so much about what you're doing it's about the fact that we include lots of third-party CSS, or mm -hmm. we include scripts that include more CSS for our commenting system, for a live chat system, for, you know, God knows what widget you've got on your site or in WordPress or whatever. And if one of those gets compromised, mm -hmm. then it compromises you downstream. Um, so yeah. they've got all this information on content security policies and things like that that help it. But... At the same time, my concern is more is, isn't so much the third party. It's as a user, how do I trust random website X that I'm going to mm -hmm. that they aren't doing that intentionally and using the fact that it's hard <laughs> to detect and hard to see as a means of uh, of logging that stuff. So, and it's I mean we only covered like some of the ones that have been identified. You could probably do other things with it too. Oh, I I don't even want to think yeah. about like if you really <laughs> wanted to get creative with this stuff. Yeah, I think you could get real gnarly. The when it's, when I started looking at the examples using the the feature queries and, and yeah. keyframes and stuff, I was like, my brain really started going then because it's like, oh man, <laughs> operating systems. They show you like, well, if you detect certain fonts, then right. you know which operating system they're on because there are different font sets the that are supported natively. Well, I was when I was looking for that uh, about fifteen minutes ago. Um, I was I I was like you know I forgot what it was called, but I kept seeing all those things for like um, verify if your password is secure. <laughs> Thinking like, oh man, please don't ever use those. I, like, <laughs> don't ever type your password into a site that you are not signing into. Just period. Well, the real topic for this evening is uh, form usability. We're kind of we we talked about. Uh, usability as it applied to don't make me think last uh last episode and we kind of wanted to continue some of that flow but in a more tangible way and kind of try to connect some of that you know that philosophy and that mm -hmm. thought process to something that you can use and so yeah forms are the big obvious dude because forms are high value things that you build um right you know, out of anything if doesn't matter if you're you know a, a b2b if if you're selling stuff online whatever you know, odds are a form is somewhere in your funnel and is the difference between making money and not making money. So mm -hmm. ensuring that those are good and usable is incredibly important uh, to you as a web developer or as a business at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And when we say forms too, I'm talking like particularly about forms as a communication transactional tool, not necessarily a form as like, a part of an application. The good way to, I think, think about it is it's when a user is genuinely expecting something in return. Right. So right. if I register for an account, my expectation right. as a user is I get an account. Right. If, or like providing payment information yeah. or signing up. If, or, if you finish yeah. your cart in your checkout, then you expect to receive goods in return or you know, right. even something as simple as a newsletter sign up, I give you my name and email, I expect to get emails as a result of that. So there's this, mm -hmm. you know, I give you information, you give me something I want as a user. Um, because yeah. there's no other reason for a user to fill out that form otherwise. Right. There's, I mean, I challenge anybody to come up with an example where that's not true. Because at the very <laughs> least, they want information of some kind. Um they are getting something. <laughs> Nobody's like, I'm just going to fill out this form because fuck you. That's why. <laughs> like that's. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What about petitions? They they are filling out the form because they want to generate change in the world. But do they though? Well, it doesn't matter if it does. It matters what their expectation <laughs> is. All right, fair. <laughs> there are a lot of very like individual issues with forms. Um, you've got like high level and low level, and so I wanted to start like the, at the low level, like some of the little bitchy yeah. things that you can dig into. 
like browser inconsistencies, which it's still frustrating that we have to talk about browser inconsistencies in 2019, yet here we are. Um, mm -hmm. The date field. We've got this fancy yeah. new HTML5 date field. And yet it still sucks. Um, it's still different yeah. in every browser. Uh, yep. It's just proxying a text field at the end of the day. They they still have this problem where uh, thing when when we have these fields and we look at them from Safari to Chrome to Edge and every one of them has a different pop up that functions slightly differently has a different tab order as you're trying to navigate around it. Um, mm -hmm. You know nothing is more frustrating to me as I get older than having to fill out birthday fields that are date time pickers. Yeah, because you have to go and because depending on the implementation, they may or may not let you go backwards 36 years to easily get to your <laughs> month. You are sitting there like click, 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 click or something like that. It drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> and then you get this push and I debate whether or not this is for better or worse, but this idea of design of these elements. Um, we did this for a long time with select boxes where designers wanted to have control over the way those elements looked and behaved. Oh. And so you could get browser consistency then, but then you didn't have any consistency for the user. At least if I'm a Safari user, yeah. all of the date pickers are the same if they are allowed to be browser default. The select box issue is a real common one, and it's one I think people are mm -hmm. maybe most familiar, familiar with. Or a variant of this is also the checkbox or radio box styling, oh. um, where people would do things like you wouldn't have an actual select box you would have a div that had click binders to it that would yep. do things like toggle a visual drop down that then when you click on <laughs> they would store the value in like in like a hidden field um yeah. but it wasn't an actual yep. select field and generally they were pretty inaccessible um as a result as well you know what that reminds me of is when people do checkbox checkbox lists but that has a caption that says please select only one <laughs> just use the radio group yeah and that's <laughs> there's uh we'll get into some stuff later that is one of the common suggestions of if you've got just a short list that you pick one from yeah don't use select boxes uh yeah. in general let the users see their options uh yep but these inconsistencies and these this desire to exert control over elements in different ways generally leads again and I, I can already see that we should make a shirt that just has Jacob's Law printed on it at this point. <laughs> that, you know, we've – there's this argument, and I've ran into it a million times over the last probably dozen mm -hmm. years where when people, particularly designers uh, or stakeholders, see a layout and they see a form layout that has a, you know, a drop down, let's say, and they see that they like the way or it's the check boxes and they love the way the check boxes look. And they're like, it has to look that way, all browsers. And so you're muddling through with <laughs> different, you know, CSS prefixes or whatever to try to get these to look right. And, you know, the, and the argument is because we want the site to look the same, no matter who's using it where, but that's a very business focused view because your user isn't using it across multiple browsers right they use one browser and they right. use all the sites in that browser and so your obligation to the form usability at that point is to honor the way the browser wants to do that at that point for better or worse that's a really that's a really good point i i, I can consider that yeah, the browser is like their lens yeah. that they see the, the internet through. Yeah. And think about huh. how many different date pickers they see, you know, filling out <laughs> forms over the course of a month or whatever. Uh, right. And they, you know, no doubt people figure it out. They're able to, you know, as long as it's not a weird, bizarre convention, they get there. But you you could, you know, fill their reservoir of goodwill, so to speak, by <laughs> giving them that experience. It's like, oh, yeah, they're just doing the, the normal one. I know how that works. You can you can really do a lot with CSS when you're styling your select boxes too. It's not I mean back when like CSS version 1 you, there was only limited there was so much you could do yeah. with how it how you changed it. But nowadays though, especially with like placeholders 
and you know all the ways you can make it look visually different you can even do grouping like opt group you can do like element grouping in there um all kinds of stuff that you can do like if you haven't recently with html5 look up the api for select the select box because there's a, a lot of potential there yeah, I, I remember when we used to have to do like div wrappers around them with and of mm -hmm. course back then and here's a, a topic for a future show whatever happened to css sprites um i remember running <laughs> oh yeah css sprites that had you know the the clicked or unclicked state of the drop down arrow yeah. and you just move that up and down in the background i think that bandwidth just increased to the point where the performance gain by using a sprite sheet was negligible contain compared to the time it would take to maintain it the next group of like curmudgeon -y things are are buttons <laughs> <laughs> and the way we label and position buttons on a form. So there's three real common buttons that you see a lot of. Submit buttons, cancel buttons, and reset buttons. Now, pretty much everybody is going to tell you you should never have a reset button. Mm -hmm. If you have a reset button, you should contextually have a real reason to have a reset button. And it, ha it better be a good yeah. reason. Cancel buttons are not quite as bad, but... right. You should be certain that you want a user to be able to cancel what they're doing as opposed to just leave, so to speak, because that risk right. always exists then of hitting that cancel button accidentally. Right around the time when we went into production with the diaper base app, I, I went through and I I made up a like a helper file, sort of like a library of functions to render uh, buttons, essentially, and other form elements. Um, cause there's a lot of like reused code, but I wanted to make sure that it looked identical across all the different forms that we had. And so, um, the way we did cancel, like I have a button for cancel button and we would show it as the background of the button would be transparent. The outline of the button and the text I think was white or maybe light gray if it was on a white background. Um, and it would always be on the bottom left because we're in America, we read, or in English, at least we read left to right. And so left implies going back. So it would always be in the bottom left of the form. It wouldn't be tiny, but it also wouldn't be very large. But it would be obvious and it would be, um, but kind of like visually diminished. Yeah. It's, there's this super thin line between if you're going to offer both buttons, if you're going to have a mm -hmm. submit button and a cancel button, there's this thin line between trying to make them good and usable and encourage people to continue through the funnel and hit the submit button um, and providing that cancel button as a dark pattern mm -hmm. and potentially trying to hide it, you know, move yeah. it off or, you know, any number of things that can happen there where either people don't realize they can cancel, um, you know, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. like a shot, let's say a shopping cart. I may decide yeah. legitimately that I don't want to buy this thing now. And yeah. yes, I could just leave maybe, but maybe your store retains the cart and I come back and it's still mm -hmm. there later. Um, I need a way. Right. And, I, and, you know, there's never a good experience trying to delete stuff out of your cart or change inventory or whatever. I just want to hit a cancel right. button and get the stuff out. You don't want to hide it. You don't want it to be like this secretive thing. But you also don't right. want people to mistake it for the submit button. So there's this right, super right. thin line between good usability and getting into a dark pattern. When I was at Cornell, we had some like a, an official usability accessibility firm audit some of our uh, forms that we had, and and that was one of the things they they dinged us on a couple pages was that we needed to have a more uh, obvious way for users to explicitly get out of the the form workflow like having them close the tab or browser or whatever wasn't enough it needed to be something where a user could say with certainty if i click this button i will be out of the workflow yeah. i can abandon it the user wants to know that yeah because again it's all about goals right and if the user's goal is to stop what they are doing and get out they want an affirmative response that they were able to get out uh, and that's right. i think really true on any kind of form that is like hard funneled like when mm -hmm. you get into that form, that's the page. It's not just like a form on a page. I think that's where right. you see that that distinction the most. With the with the submit buttons, um, the the standard that I've kind of adopted is um, always on the bottom right or the top right, depending on the form, or both. Um, and then 
make it larger and use whatever is the primary palette color. Um, I, I try to avoid using greens and reds unless it's clear that it's kind of indicated by an icon or something else because of colorblindness. But um, oh, always on the right yeah, side and always larger because of Fitz, uh, Fitz Law is the one that the uh, the time to acquire the target is a function of the distance to it and the size of the target. So if people have um, shaky hands or um, just difficulty maneuvering a mouse for whatever reason, then um, it makes it easier to click on it. Not to mention on mobile devices, fat finger. Oh, yeah. yeah and right. I need to be able to hit it with my <laughs> finger. So, And with submit buttons in particular, there's also this problem of like submit is basically the button version of click here. It doesn't, it right. doesn't mean anything, right? I think what I, we need to get into this habit of having the button convey the actual action being taken. So yes, send yes. a question or you know submit an answer. Like if it's if it's submit with other words, I think that's okay. So the the standard that I've been doing is if, if you're if it's like a cred app where you're like you've loaded a record up and you are you know you want to um, save the changes, then I call it save. Right. It, you know, use the icon if you want, but save. And then if you want to, if you're making a new one, then you either call it, um, I think save also works if you're creating a new record, but I, you could also do create or, um, but like contextualize it. I, I really think that just like with hyperlinks, like you want the action, like you were saying, to be really clear. Like with our contact form on the Drunken UX website, if you go to our contact form, incredibly simple. I actually think it follows all but one piece of advice, um, but our submit button doesn't say submit. It says send message. So you know <laughs> when you hit that button, you you are going to be sending your information to us. Oh, yeah. There was a, nice. a form I saw recently on a website where it had a submit button, and when you hit submit, it didn't submit. It took you to a review page where you see oh. the information you just entered, and then you hit another button. And yeah. it's so easy, and this is why this is dangerous. If I hit submit, and then I see my information presented on the page, I just think that's confirmation that here's the information yep. you just sent. And it was by sheer luck that I happened to notice the second button that then said, you know, whatever it said at that point, you know, send this, send I, this data or whatever. I had a, a bill pay thing on a, a banking website where it would do that, and it would... I mistakenly, I, I missed a bill one month because I, I thought that I had sent it, but it turns out I got to the confirmation page and I had to click OK one more time for it to go through. And I, I didn't see that that month. Yeah. So, oops. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> and we, I didn't have it in the show notes anywhere, but that's kind of an important point in the submission process of your, your form funnel. If, you know, for any reason, legally, you know, if you're an e-commerce site and you need that, uh, that portion where you're like, you're about to submit this. Are you sure? Confirm what mm -hmm. you're doing. You know, it's not the form at that point. It's a review page, but that's why the button labels, um, the right. micro interactions are really important or uh, micro copy is really important to tell the user what they're about to do. So they know Yeah, I hit the button and the next step is, you know, submit for or like review your order. And then I know, yeah. okay, I'm going to hit yeah. this button and I'm going to get my review page. And then the review page has a submit this order or send yeah. this order, or order your crap uh, button that then lets me know that <laughs> now, you know, I shouldn't leave this page without hitting that last button. And that's the submit button is especially because submit buttons change, right? On a multi-page right. form, the submit button is really a next button. Right. So you have to make sure. And so you should call it next. Yeah, it should be called next. Yeah. And you have to understand that your context is going to change for that user when they get to the last page. And so they need to know they have nothing left. Right. And I, I think you could even go so far as to have, I mean, if, if you're able to have some copy above that, that says, um, you know, when you're ready, uh, click on review. Don't worry. You'll be able to review like where you get to review your, your order before you submit yeah. it. I, I think I, I forget where it was, but I saw some site that did that. And it wasn't obtrusive, and it was nice to just get a reminder, like, okay, when I click on this, you know, it's it's not committed yet. I'll get to review it one more time. You still have a safety net. Right, right. There was a uh, Krug 
Krug had said um, in Don't Make Me Think, he was talking about like not, don't use weird names for your for your links. Like he, the one he was was about like jobs, like you know, just call it jobs or maybe careers, something like that. Don't call it like the example he used was Jobarama, <laughs> um, or even like work here, like that. Like just call it jobs. People are looking for the word jobs, and I think that in this same case, don't use weird titles for those buttons go with like one maybe two words at most something really obvious um you can express yourself and express your brand in other places and other ways on the page or the site but like with form stuff you're creating a compact or a contract with the user about what they're to expect from you so we should be really clearly communicate yeah. that highly transactional everything yes. about a form is highly transactional yeah. So, and, and to that end, the way we use labels and placeholders, super mm. problematic. First, there's a super simple piece of this that is so often screwed up, which is make sure that your labels are actually labels, which means, A, don't just have a text string next to an input. Actually wrap it in oh, a label element. The way, right, the label but, element. Also make sure you're using a for attribute on that. Yes. Using a label without a for attribute is like using an an A without an href. You right. need those two things go together and should always be used together because you want those labels to be clickable in their entirety. So you click the label, yes. it focuses you on that field or it selects that checkbox or radio box. That context tying the label to the input is an accessibility affordance. Because it mm -hmm. ensures that a screen reader knows which label to read with which field. If you've just got a right. label now, I, th I think in some cases, and I'm not, I, I don't use screen readers. I can't tell you if they all do this. I know some of them are contextually aware that a label followed by an input is generally considered the label for that input. Or some people, I don't like this. I know it's not necessarily incorrect, but I don't love the implementation where they will wrap the label tag around the input. Around, yeah, I've seen that too. Um, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that, and I'm not. Eh. I, I, it's not incorrect. I don't think. Then, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong on that in HTML5. But I, I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule about that. I would like to have some kind of official word. This is the way we expect you to do it from the W3C or something. But, yeah. And I don't know that every screen reader is smart enough to, uh, again, contextually attach that label to mm -hmm. the input if it's wrapped around it and it's not using right. the for as well. My advice is don't do that, frankly. I and mean, that's, that's all I can say on that. <laughs> placeholders. So we've got this thing, right? We've got labels and we've got placeholders. Mm -hmm. Labels are not placeholders. Placeholders are not labels. Uh, <laughs> labels tell you what the field is a placeholder Wait, uh, yeah clarify what a placeholder so is. yeah the, the placeholder is the text inside of the text field or input before you've clicked on it right so it's that shadow text kind of in the background um yeah so you you know it might be the label might say password but the placeholder mm -hmm. might say you know enter six to eight characters with no special characters because they right don't respect strong passwords uh, now, <laughs> let's look past the fact that generally placeholders are inaccessible because they are usually very light. So they mm -hmm. will fail a contrast check. And I don't know that they're read by screen readers either. Um, again, I don't. That's something I've never yeah. had to test. Um, so I can't tell you yeah. straight out if it does or not. Um, I can, I'll, I'll ask about but that. But I know visually you tend to make them light enough that they don't pass uh, a contrast check and if you make them dark enough so that they are perfectly readable then you confuse your user because it looks like the field is already <laughs> entered right so <laughs> it's that's one problem but that's just one problem the other problem that we've developed is this this uh move towards not having labels or having labels that are visually hidden the placeholder it becomes the label so the placeholder yeah. says first name. And when you click on it, it goes away, and people love it because it lets you fake having a short form. 
Right. You've you've now condensed your form down to just the fields, <laughs> and the fields tell you exactly what they are. So it's it's perfect that way, right? I there there is there is something aesthetically pleasing about that. Like I I like the elegance of it, but I also I know that you should not do don't yeah, do that. and that's exactly why yeah. that happens. Um, designers yeah. think it looks good. People think it looks good uh, because it does. Yeah. It, it it absolutely reduces the vertical height of the form. Um, right. It makes it look simpler. Uh, I don't I don't mm. know if it actually feels simpler to a user at that point, but it does look simpler to just glance at it. Right. Certainly, it's not good for users. And let me give you an right. example of why. And I I kind of hit on it talking about making placeholders be contrasty, but there are a lot of forms that you can have pre-filled with a value when somebody hits a page, whether that's from a mm-hmm. URL value, you know, a contact form, maybe something they've got a user account. So you go ahead and you fill in their user information, um, shopping, right. you know, a shopping system will do that with uh, addresses frequently. But if I come into one of these, field and it's filled something in especially if it's something that isn't mine like maybe it's mm. it's filled in a product name or something into a field <laughs> let's just say but th- now since there's a value in that field i don't know why it's there necessarily right because i can't see the label so i don't know it's saying you know a product you liked or you know whatever the the use case is there has a zero in one of the fields from something I did, who knows when. (laughs) And that will randomly get inserted into forms, uh, (laughs) depending on what it thinks. You know, if I've clicked one of whatever form fill it is and I hit the wrong one and it fills a bunch of stuff and I'll see that zero pop up in an address field or something like that. And it, you know, it, it's a problem and it's something that, um, you know, that can slow down a person using mm-hmm. your form and if it slows them down they have more opportunity to leave then yeah and it's it's something i don't here's what i don't get because there's an article uh from nielsen norman on this that we'll have linked that has an a breakdown of this and they show yeah. you you know of course the best way in the world to do it is the way no designer wants to do it which is you have your label <laughs> you have some help text that is also the placeholder but it's outside the field so users can always see it but right. they don't like that. But they gave an example that I did think was actually really elegant, which was a field that had a placeholder in it. But when you clicked mm-hmm. on it and started typing, the label actually moved up above the label and into that, yeah. that top margin space right above the field. So you could still see the label. It just moved. And it didn't do it obtrusively. It was just a very... Very little smooth, and again, I used the phrase if, earlier, but micro-interactions. If you're unable to uh, check your browser right now, what it looks like is, if you've ever seen the field set with the legend, what it looks like is that there's a field set wrapped around an individual field and where the help placeholder text get, becomes the legend for that field yeah. set. That's kind of what like it looks like. They've given the field you know, a, a focus state and mm-hmm. la- layered the label over, you know, they've used a little bit of negative yeah. margining to kind of Z index it right above that. So it looked, it, A, it did, it just, it looked very nice. It does, it's pretty sharp. <laughs> and it really takes care of that problem in a really elegant way. And it makes it really easy mm-hmm. to distinguish a field for whether or not it's been entered. Uh, because right. if you see that, that secondary label, you now know that that field has been entered. I think one of the suggestions they had on that page was where a similar thing, but it takes the it does a regular label and then the placeholder text is sort of um like a contextual hint yeah. about what kind of thing it's looking for but then when you start typing it it moves that text above the field between the label and the field um sort of because they what they talked about was the uh the short term memory management which we talked about in the last episode about cognitive load um and you know like it um you may remember easily that it's a password six to eight characters or whatever because you're thinking why on earth would they make it that but okay uh but still it's something that you now have to remember and then the same thing like repeatedly doing that it's going to tap into that the the what is the reservoir of goodwill that's what we're calling yeah. it okay well that's not what we called it that's what Krug called oh. it 
<laughs> I didn't make that up. I called it something else at one point uh, because I'm dumb. There's there's also this, um, and this is kind of a minor thing, but labels, if you're using labels correctly, keep them above your fields. Mm. Don't move them off to yeah. the side, the left or right. And this sounds right. stupid, and again, people still do it. You get away with it, and that's fine. But the thing is, from a visual fixation standpoint, if you mm -hmm. look at a label and field pair that is vertically aligned to each other, you capture all of that in your feed. Because your, your field of focus, like when you're reading a screen, you've only got about two inches of horizontal space that your eyes are actually able to truly focus on on the screen. I can't read yeah. the words that are three lines, four lines down from the word I'm looking at. I have to move my eyes. Right. And when you put your labels and uh, fields in line, what you've done is now to, to grasp all of that in my visual spectrum, I have to focus twice now because I have to focus to the left to see right. the label. Then I have to focus to the right to see my field. And if I have any question right. as I'm you know, processing this, I have to scan back and forth. I can't hold all of it inside of my visual area of focus. Um, and so keeping everything vertical, and keep in mind from a scanning standpoint, and this is going to come up later yep. too, you know, people scan vertically, and we do scan, and we scan a lot. And simplifying that makes it way better. Also from a visual grouping perspective, um, we're going to anchor, we're going we're gonna to think that each image element is basically anchored by its left side, and so if you put put the label to the left of the field, the 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 anchor on the left side of the field is going to be further away from the anchor on the input field. So if you put it above it, they're much they're nearly adjacent. It's going to be an easier visual tie yeah. together. Um, with this, so we'll keep this ball rolling. Help text was uh, another mm -hmm. area, and help text is interesting because sometimes you know. I think it's absolutely necessary sometimes. So the password field, I think, is a good example. Sure. So you need to have help text in that case because it is something that the user cannot themselves infer mm. without being told that. I, I would think that a, a good a good like bottom rule here might be to say if you have validation on something for a field, you should have some kind of indicator to the user preemptively that that aspect is going to be validated the most common one we would see is required and usually we just do it with like a red asterisk or something but if you have uh complexity requirements or passwords you know it's a it's a nice thing to let them know beforehand so that they don't have to keep resubmitting the field over and over again yeah. <laughs> if you have a field that requires like instructions to use you may want to also consider <laughs> the complexity of the form that you have already created. You know, if, if if you're saying, make sure you've already entered, you know, a job title from the field above before picking yeah. your area of expertise and, you know, <laughs> and going into like this, like, make sure you've also, you know, waved at the moon while dancing in a, a <laughs> counterclockwise fashion, like, that you've all you've made your form too hard. Like you have built a bad form. That's what that means. I th I think it was either uh, Donald. I think it was Donald Norman. It may have been Steve Krug, but I think it was Donald Norman who was uh, talking about this in the design of everyday things. And he was saying, um, if you have to provide an explanation for how the thing should be used, they you should see that as an opportunity to improve the uh the affordances or the way that you're using the thing um the the example that he gave was like with stoves where you have like my gas stove has you know four a range of two by two so there's four burners and then the the burner knobs like many gas stoves are arranged left to right and each one of them has a little diagram next to it that indicates which burner it goes to that's helpful um so you don't have to think or try each of them individually what happens when that label like rubs off though? And so the example he gives instead is what would happen instead if you either had all four knobs around one another, like in, in a grid that mirrors what the layout is on the tape on the stovetop or um, something comparable to that. 
where you're the where it's an obvious mapping from one to one. And I think, you know, you're you're always gonna run into these and I think the the password example is probably one of the better ones that there are reasons to have specific rules on a password and if you mm -hmm. are not in a position to change the rules to make them easier, then you do need to have those there. Uh but yeah. if if it's definitely a matter of I need this help text here because if I don't put it there, the users are not going to be able to do this. <laughs> well, you're solving the wrong problem. That's what that's what that's <laughs> telling you. So take, you know, take away from that uh, uh, that information. The other example, I I know we've talked about Norman doors before. Yeah. Like if you have a door and you have to specify push or pull, design a better door. <laughs> <laughs> There's a restaurant here in town that's got it, – it has uh, a, the two-way doors, but one yeah. is always locked. <laughs> Never know which one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not always it's not the same always one? not always the same one. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> uh, so the last, like, individual thing that I was thinking about is focus states, um, mm -hmm. which is to say partly make sure you have them is, is a big yeah. part of that. Make sure if you click on a field that that field – highlights itself that it stands out you know and oh that's that's smart. most browsers I, i'm chrome does it i'm pretty sure safari does it like the browser itself will apply certain highlighting to it if you don't override it anyway mm -hmm. and you can usually rely on that pretty effectively but there are also cases where folks will like normalize that away so to speak and if you do that you need to make sure that you put something back in that very clearly indicates which field you're on, especially if A, yeah. you've pre-filled any information for them, B, thinking about accessibility and making sure the user cognitively knows which field they're on, um, mm -hmm. and it's extremely useful for touch devices to know that I've hit the right field and which field I'm on on my little screen. So those right. focus states are very important in, in those contexts. I, w I would add add to that if you do um like a toaster or a like a pop-up alert like from an if you're doing ajax submissions or whatever um when the when the thing pops up you need to give it focus you can use javascript just do a get element by id and then dot focus and that'll jump the the browser focus right to it um but you need to do that so that people who are browsing with their keyboard using screen readers can dismiss well it can be notified but then can also dismiss yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because those the the toaster pop ups in particular they'll cover up part of the field above them usually, right? And so if yeah. I need to go back to one of them as well, um, I need to be able to get rid of that. That's that's real good thinking on that. Um, mm -hmm. And even like uh, you know whether you're doing it with you know the those pop ups or any kind of error in general, if there's if mm -hmm. they go to submit the form and a field is wrong then give the user immediate focus back on that field so they can just immediately yeah. type, like, especially if it's an empty field. And, and please highlight any fields that have errors. Yeah, yeah. give it oh. very clear. That's not so much focus, but it is attention. You know, Make sure yeah. you are able to draw attention to a field that is incorrect. Don't make the user hunt for it. And don't just use it. Like, the red required dot, I think, is relatively okay for telling somebody that something is required. But if they have failed that, yeah, don't use something that tiny more. and small and easy to overlook. Highlight the box in red. Turn the background red. I think, I, I think my favorite interactions with the form when, I've, when I missed something or other is when there's a you – know, it bumps you back to the form. If there is a notice at the top, it just says, like, uh, you know, the error message, your your form has some missing some fields or something like that. And then it jumps me right to the first field that has an error. The field is clearly marked, usually with like a red border or something similar, some kind of clear red mark. Um, and the cursor's in it. And there's an error message that says specifically what validation failed yeah. right by it. So let's talk about user testing real fast and like testing and sure. tracking forms and trying to take all these little bits and start putting them together. Um, yeah, of course, last week we <laughs> talked about, you know, usability and this idea that you can do user testing, cheap, simple, um, and forms need to be the same way. Cause one of the big things that I'm going to emphasize through the rest of this is that 
nothing is absolutely true. There are a lot of things that are frequently true. Um, right. But nothing is absolutely true, and you should always take the time to test individual things, um, even mm -hmm. if that test is just talking to a few people. <laughs> I've got a location field that I've been working on for a while, and this location, it's and it's a, a case of kind of like the password field where it had some mm -hmm. restrictions on the, the options in the location field that were outside of my control. And I've okay. had users look at this field before and – or not necessarily at the field. I've had them use a form and then said, right. okay, tell me what you thought. Do you know, how did that feel? 100% of the people, 100%, <laughs> sample size of like four people, 100% of the people all come back and said, didn't really know what to look for in the location field. Yeah. Seems simple, right? It's it's a location field. It's a list of locations. It's a finite list of locations. The yeah. problem in this case was that the the list is a mix of localities, like cities, states, regions. Uh -huh. And they are alphabetized, but because the options are not consistent and are not thorough. Like it's one thing if you have a yeah. list of 50 states. Okay, it's a big list. But an alphabetical list of states is an alphabetical list of states, and I can tell very quickly that it's a list of all of them. Yeah, I I would almost think that 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 drop down might benefit from having opt groups or something, right. and just say like like northeast, southeast, whatever. So yeah, because the idea is if I'm trying to pick the correct location for what I'm I'm selecting, I have to mm. figure out which one is right for me. But that requires me yeah. to physically sort through the whole list on my own and it's not right. super long but it's not short and if i don't know if i'm looking for a city or an area name or whatever it makes the cognitive load on that field <laughs> very high uh i remember the issue that i had was that there was no obvious all selection like if i wanted to look for all regions yeah and not just once i did i did figure it out but it wasn't obvious and it's the kind of thing that, you know, it's it's confirming a suspicion. We've mm -hmm. known that this is an issue. You know, we've been working on different solutions for it. But sitting down with actual users and having them tell me on their own, you know, without me even asking, I can ask, <laughs> how was, you know, how did that, you know, how did selecting that place work for you? They volunteered <laughs> that information that, yeah, you know, all this stuff went well. You know, I got through this part fine. But I... I got really confused when I was clicking on this stuff, and it was very mm -hmm. telling very quickly. It's that idea, right, that the obvious problems will present themselves very easily if with just a few, yeah. you know, very simple tests. Five minutes, you know, is all it took for these folks yep. to give me that information. So those are really good cases of how you get this information and how you translate it into something you can take action on. Um yeah. You know, another another good example is in that same vein, you don't have to do anything real specific. Just have them fill out the form. Yeah. Just have them go through it. More specifically, and like to your case, talking about uh, uh, toaster pop-ups and whatnot, mm -hmm. have them go through it without a mouse. You'd be surprised how much that can tell you. Yeah. You go it's, through it it's without pretty, a mouse. Yeah. Try it on your own. It's it really reveals a lot of um, we we make so many assumptions about being able to use a mouse when we're interacting with the form. So when you have to just use your tab keys, w one thing that you're going to notice real quickly is um, when you're tabbing through it, if your tab indices are wrong, or if you're using CSS to display fields in an order that maybe is different than what it flows on the HTML. Um, you're going to notice those like oddities and, and things you don't expect. Um, have tab index on every tabable field on your form and set it equal to zero. What that does is it automatically assigns the sequence, the browser will, um, on the order that it shows up. If you don't want it to be tabable, use negative one. Don't use any positive numbers. Like don't try to set it yourself. It's just, it's not worth it. Just use zero. Uh, and but make sure you have tab index set for them. It's really important. <laughs> yeah, what will happen is if you set tab index yourself, 
the first time you go back to edit that form and you move a field or swap a field, you've mm-hmm. fucked up your entire tab index. Yeah, yeah. The reason that exists, because you're probably saying, well, if you just set it to auto, then what would it matter? And I'm going to get into this <laughs> here in a little bit, but it's like if you had columned fields that have mm-hmm. to go back and forth as well as up and down. Go oh, keyboard, keyboard filling it out without the mouse. Also, if you have anything weird like um, uh, revealed content or any kind of funny interactions or like JavaScript stuff happening, and it would require a mouse or something otherwise, doing it with a keyboard will will reveal that to you. Yeah, it's it's that idea too of doing things like making sure that sometimes you can't just bind to just click. You should also bind to blur, for instance. To right. make sure that you're yeah. triggering events if you've got any kind of yeah high level uh, interactions mm-hmm. or, or something like that going on. Um, just one last thing to that. Um, I put a link into the show notes for Andy A N D I. It's uh, a tool we use at work. Um, my five hundred eight auditor uses it. It's provided by the Social Security Administration, and it's a little thingy you put it into your toolbar of your browser, and then when you load a page, you click on it. And it runs a JavaScript thing against the page, and it will identify uh, 508 issues for you. Nice. It's it's really it's really easy to use, and it gives you an obvious thing. And um, it it's not 100 percent exhaustive, but it'll catch most things. the The next thing you can do to help you test and track what form problems you're having is set up an abandonment logger. Measure as people are leaving your page if they if they start filling the form and then leave. You want to measure where they're leaving at. That was, in the case of this this location drop-down, that was one of the first signs that something was amiss for me, was I saw a lot of people leaving right after they hit that field. Um, mm-hmm. And what you can do, the way this works is, and I've got it implemented in Google Analytics using Tag Manager. And so I've got a tag okay. that, I've got, it's actually a couple tags. And uh, if I, I'll look up a link for it uh, in the show notes. It's I used a technique that uh, Simo Ava had written up originally, and I modified it uh, for our case. It fires a JavaScript, just a plain JavaScript tag when the page mm-hmm. loads on a form. And what it does is it binds a, an event to every form field that mm-hmm. just listens. Okay. And as you click fields, it basically beacons to the uh, the variable and tells it this was the last field click. Okay. And then there's, a, I bind to an on before unload event for the page. Okay. And when, if it, if it detects an on before unload and it doesn't have a form submit in my tag stack. Right. Then it fires off an event to Google Analytics that says, Oh, you know, I, I put it in my forms category, my action is abandoned, and my label is the field that they used last. Because I, I need to track something, and so I picked the last field clicked, basically. Oh, that's uh, really cool. So it gives me a running log then. If I can, I can see if, you know, anybody who starts filling out our form and doesn't complete it, right. I can see where they were. Did they fill nice. out the whole form, and then they just decided not to? Did they get halfway through and... Then you know get stuck. What happened? And it it's not like an authority, but it's a starting point. It gives me questions to then ask. We should we should write up, or I guess maybe you because you know how to do it. A blog post on our site, like with kind of a step by step and how to set that up. Uh, actually, I do think that already exists because I'm about a hundred percent sure I wrote it. Oh, <laughs> uh, I will. Uh, it. Oh, yeah. I'll look it up and throw it uh, either. In the nice. show notes or somewhere else, but yeah, I because I've given a, a talk on it um, in the yeah. past and I showed how we did it and I wrote I wrote up the notes on that. So yeah, I'll I'll put it together. And like I say, it's just it's it's a take on on Simo's work, mm-hmm. you know, and it's cool just tweaked a little bit for our particular use case. Nice. The other and the the mate to that is error logging. So mm-hmm. most people have some kind of validation running on their forms anymore. If you've got any kind of Hopefully. like complex form, um, you've got validation running or you're, cause you're using a plugin. Most likely if you're in WordPress, you know, and mm-hmm. you're using contact form seven or C forms or Caldera or whatever, they all have validation built into them. Right. There's the validate plugin for jQuery as well. 
Mm -hmm. If you've got this validation running and you aren't logging the errors that it is throwing to users, then you're throwing away information because that is telling you what fields people are screwing up the most. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So you could ping, you know, don't, you wouldn't want to log the information they're putting in necessarily, but you could log the type of error it was. So you, would you do that um, like with the same kind of system you had before where you just like with, track? Yeah, with track the, like with the abandons? Yeah. Yeah, and, I would do it very the... similarly. I would basically tie an event in Tag Manager mm -hmm. to the validation. And okay. if, if it throws an error, I would say, okay, it's time to fire off a Google Analytics event. Yeah. And I would capture, you know, whatever error it threw and just log huh. that as uh, an event in Google Analytics. So would you log it every time it happens or just note in your like uh, request response that it um that it occurred? I'd probably note it every time it happens because if it happens multiple times even on the same form, I think that's okay. important information. If yeah. you know passwords, I think are a good case of that. If somebody yeah fails four times to enter a password that meets the, the <laughs> conditions that we've set, then that's giving us good data that people are having a lot of trouble coming up with a password that has everything, you yeah. know, that is required. Cause, and this is true because a lot of systems, and this is where, like, this is the opposite of the too simple password in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, some systems require complex passwords. So it has to have 12 characters with a number and a capital letter and a special character. And so if you've got all of those conditions, it's worth logging those errors every time somebody fails one or more of those conditions. So you can see that and maybe think, maybe we can do something to help them be fast. Um, the other side of the validation thing, and this is incredibly interesting to me, and we're going to have links to two different sets of uh, research on this. There is this incredibly funny paradox of <laughs> you should do validation but it shouldn't be instant inline validation it should be validation after the submit button is clicked okay unless so you read the other research which says what is instant it instant thinking like literally as you're typing in the field so if okay. you start typing in an email address right it conceivably will tell you your email address is wrong when you're right. halfway through typing it because you haven't before you've even made an attempt yeah, with but say, before like, you've even enough. finished it um, that's annoying yeah I don't that's like annoying that. and the compromise some of them make is they will validate quote unquote instantly but it's really like on blur so as soon yeah. as you blurt out of the field um and i the distinction between these two competing sets of research is not so much what isn't isn't instant but it's more do you validate as the user's inputting information or do you validate after the submit button is clicked? Right. And it's, it's, I, I don't have an answer because there's an article at UX movement. They've got a couple different uh, pieces of research. They cite where inline validation screwed people up because it disrupts the flow of what they're doing. Uh, it has, people have bad, like, People are in completionist mode when they're in a form. They're trying to go field to field right. to field. And if errors are causing them to go back and forth, it actually makes it harder for them to process. Hmm. Luke Rabluski has research over at a list apart that showed that adding inline validation increased all of their conversions by like 22%. So <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. And, and I said at the start of this, you know, check stuff. Test but verify is sort of the, the rule of thumb. <laughs> you know, I, I think you just have to consider the context of your use case and figure out if, you know, do A-B tests on it or something like that and see yeah. if one is yeah, appreciably better than the other because the, the differences are significant in the research. Like, we're talking, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent changes in conversions. So right. we're not we're not talking about, like, one person, you know, or 5%. We're talking about statistically significant differences. Sure. Uh, so it's it's interesting. an interesting battle. And I think it's just, it's one of those things where I wish there was a more clear cut uh, example. And I, I think, because Luke's work is actually from several years ago. Uh, the stuff in UX movement is somewhat newer than that. And I'm wondering if it's not a sign of a, the change in times. Because when Luke yeah. did his research, it was still very early in 
this idea of doing like inline validation. So it was a very new concept to people. It was a new way to interact with the form, and I think it helped people out. But now that forms are so you know intent on doing that, I think maybe the user habits have changed, and it's the yeah. way we use forms cognitively has changed, and maybe you know it's impacted. It's one of those things where what was true years right. ago isn't necessarily true now because we change. So, I for me personally. I I would say that if you're checking validation as they're like constantly as things are typed, like on key press or whatever, that's too quickly because the user, like the user would agree with you. Yes. I know this isn't invalid. Stop. Just shut up. Yeah. But I, I think if you check for it on blur, I, I, I don't know. I, that wouldn't bother me. Um, anecdotally, I would, I would be fine knowing that my field didn't pass validation. Then I, I find it frustrating when, I have to, if I click submit and then it tells me like, oh, you messed up. Like, like the gotcha validation. I find that so annoying. You know what I think the difference there is, is that the gotcha validation, I think the big difference maker there is how it's implemented. Because That's a, true. a lot of places don't, it, like browser level required if you've got the required mm -hmm. attribute on fields and you miss one and that's all yeah. that's in use and you hit it, the, uh, the reaction of the browser to just say, you know, the, I think it just like highlights the field, puts you on focus yeah. there, but it doesn't really give you good, strong feedback that says, yeah. hey, idiot, you messed this up <laughs> and you need to fill it out. Um, so I think the way that's implemented impacts some of that. But I don't know, maybe there's more, I mean, I'm sure there's more research out there on you know, it. So. What, what about the inverse? What if instead of, uh, you know, getting the user with the stick, we get them with the carrot instead? And what if we say, as each form is filled out, a green check mark appears next to it if it passes validation? That's an interesting idea. I've seen that it. way. Um, yeah. You see it a lot on registration forms. Right, right. That way the default is is an empty form and the form just assumes that, if it if you haven't entered something in or if it's invalid, then it's just not going to show you the green check mark. But if you see the green check mark, then you know, okay, this field is good. You know where I've seen that a lot is that? on username fields. Mm, oh yeah, the yes. system will check as you're filling out the form is your username available instead yeah. of making you submit the form and then come back and say, oh, sorry, your username's in use. I see it on password, like on the password confirmation thing too. But yeah. I, I think we could use it other places too, and I, I think that might. Who likes being told that they're wrong when you could be told that you're right instead? Yeah, I haven't seen research on it, but I'll bet it's out there. Yeah. So that, that, I'd be interested in seeing it. On the same hmm. note is the length problem. Because the rule of thumb is that you want to make your form as short as you can. Short right. forms convert better. Um, and this is another one of those things that it's like, yeah, you can trust that rule of thumb, but you should verify it. Because <laughs> there's research out there. Um, there's a piece over at Venture Harbor that talks about the way form length impacts conversions. And the conventional wisdom is short forms convert better, which is generally true, but not always. Right. And it's all about context. It's all about, you know, asking the right questions in the right places. Mm -hmm. And if a user is invested in what they are asking for and the questions you're asking, if you've got to ask several questions, but they are legitimately valuable to what the user is trying to do, they will fill those fields out happily. Right. Yeah, definitely. That, it's a big difference maker. I think the question is, who, who wants this information? Does the user want to provide it to you because they think it will help them achieve whatever they want to get? Or are you wanting it because, well, because you want it? You're being, yeah, greedy yeah. from a business standpoint. <laughs> uh, there's one place where this isn't true. And you should not cheat this. If your form is really long, don't think you can cheat the length by putting <laughs> the two columns. <laughs> that is pretty much universally accepted now that two column forms are terrible UX for anybody. It's cognitively difficult. It screws yeah. up what we were just saying, the tab index. This is where your tab index can go haywire. You know, where's one place I, I, the only time I wouldn't mind seeing two columns is if um, I was using a responsive layout in the extra large width. 
like where the you know you're using a high res like optical or retina display yeah and it's like 3000 pixels wide and so it's already like everything is super small i i don't think i would mind seeing two columns there but otherwise barring that yeah i'm sure there is a context where that could be proven yeah. untrue um but generally it's good advice uh, and you'll you'll find yeah. that we're going to have several articles linked that have like you know, here are some of the things you can do right now to make your form better. And almost every one of those articles has that in there as a don't do column. <laughs> forms. Um, right. The, you know, some examples, though, like where a long form actually makes perfectly or perfect sense is mm -hmm. if you've got like deep funnel forms, these mm -hmm. are the forms that are really transactional that have to ask questions to meet the user's needs. So I'm thinking about stuff like, let's say a ticketing system. If you are- like help help ticket? You're trying to put in a help ticket for something. Okay. And it's trying, you know, it's asking you a lot of questions and they may be difficult questions. What's your operating system? What browser are you using? What time did this occur? But that's right. all information. And to your point, it's information that helps the user get the answer they need. It's not- right. They're not asking those questions necessarily because they just want them. Uh, at least they shouldn't right. be. <laughs> what you should be doing instead is looking for opportunities to shorten things up. And there are a lot of mm -hmm. those out there that are very low-hanging fruit. And one of the quick ones is the idea of names. Yeah. And so many forms do this where they ask for first and last name. And let, I'll ask you, Aaron, why do they yeah. do that? <laughs> because... They probably have a first name column and a last name column in their database. Exactly. And I I I think that I don't like it. Yeah, no, that is the exact reason they do it. Um and it's you know, it's because they want to email you and say, Well, dear Aaron, we are so glad right. you signed up and they think that, you know, that conversational casual quality will help them out. And I get that. But this is one of those areas where you have an opportunity to simplify it, you cut a field out, and I went looking around, and it was by sheer happenstance. I pulled up this article at UX Booth because I wanted to have a mm -hmm. resource to share with folks on this. Um, and it's on created, creating more inclusive and culture, culturally sensitive forms. It's inclusive design, basically. Um, but it's uh, written by a, a friend of ours. Oh, Mark. Mark yeah. Mark Anbender uh, has put this together. He's like, let's hear in Ithaca. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the idea here is... Um, hi, Mark. That, hi, Mark. <laughs> I I told you, and I, I I think I got the name right. He said there was emphasis on the an and been. Yeah. His example, though, and he broke this down. You know, the first last name is a very not necessarily American, but mm -hmm. English way of thinking Ang about names. Anglican. <laughs> Anglican way of thinking about names. Yeah. Um, and it's extremely common in uh, Hispanic Latino naming to have mm -hmm. three, four, occasionally five parts to your name. Mm -hmm. uh, Asian, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese names are mm -hmm. long. Um, any kind of Middle Eastern name tends to be mm – -hmm. can be very long, several parts. Yeah. Um, there are parts of the world where people have long names and they don't fit in the first last name. Japanese, first last names reversed. For short names too. Or short I, names. I saw I saw a thing on Twitter today. It was um uh it was someone it was an East Asian name and I think the last name was Who H U and they had a validation thing pop up that said like this is no good, it's too short. Too short. It's not yeah. a real name it's not a real name. <laughs> uh, and again the the idea to have the first and last name is a, really more of a business decision or a technical decision because of your database. Uh, and while it's uh, it's nice that you may want to address them by their first name. It's actually way better for everything else to just have a name field and just let them give you what they if, need. If you really, if you really, really, really need to have that like informal address, have another field in your form that auto populates with what your script thinks is probably the first name and just say like, is it okay if we call you this? And then have like, you know, informal name or like friendly name or whatever like as the label for it. And then that way the person can then override and type what they would like to have it called there. Yeah. I mean, if you really need it, that would be a way to, to meet that need. 
while still allowing them to type in their name as they would like to type it. Yeah. Go check out Mark's article on it. It's very good. He gives a lot of different examples of names that don't fit this scheme. Um, and I, I think it's a great reason to rethink the way we approach that. The other one is ad- address fields. We so often see address one, address two. And yeah. there are a million use cases that do not fit that comfortably, <laughs> especially if you have very specific leg- length limits on those fields, which happens a lot. Uh, right. I run into that with like on an address one field, our street name is really long. And there is a lot of times where I have to cut off the end of our street name because it doesn't fit. And so the solution to this is an article at UX Movement that goes over this idea of reducing the number of text fields you have if you are collecting addresses and combine them down and just give an address text box. Uh, mm-hmm. You can still ask for like city and state or something like that. Although I also like the the uh, process of asking for kind of like the name thing. Ask for the zip code and then auto populate the city yes. and state and let That's them change it if it's my wrong. Favorite. That's my favorite. The well, the even better one uh, lately are is uh, is people are people using? I don't know where I'm supposed to marry my verb uh, uh, now are, agreement. I think it's our people. The the example is where uh, folks have used the Google Location API. So you've got just mm-hmm. the text drop down, and you just start typing in your whole address, mm-hmm. and it uses the Google Location API to find your address in the list, and you just click <laughs> that, and then it in the background breaks it up into all of its constituent components, but you just type in one field. That's really the beautiful that is, that is nice. I would think that's very convenient. It's a little bit, tiny bit creepy. It's a tiny, tiny bit. But it is convenient, and it's nice. Well, it it's generally, like, I don't know of any cases where folks have ran into significant problems with that. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly not ones. The, the UX Movement article has some real good examples of, like, where the split address fields fail. And I feel like those mm-hmm. cases would come up much more frequently. Sure, yeah. And again, it's mod- it's modeling your form based on your data model, and, and you, sh- you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Like the user shouldn't be, in the same way that, like we were talking about before with higher ed, you shouldn't be naming these parts of your site based on your um, your institutional names, first R and everything else. Yeah. The, the last part of the length thing, and then we'll get out of your hair, mm-hmm. is uh, just simple mobile devices. Mm-hmm. Long forms are a pain in the ass on on phones, and that's all there is to yeah. it. Uh, the, yeah. The shorter the form is, the simpler it is to fill out. The quicker you get through it. You know, if you're typing on a chiclet keyboard, you don't want to fill out, you know, 27 form fields. And if you do what we were talking about earlier and implement some abandonment tracking, implement some error tracking, and start segmenting that by your mobile users versus your desktop users you're going to discover that you have a very different picture of the problems people have on different devices because they are very unique in terms of failing validation because they have trouble typing on their little keyboard. The the do your passwords match, you know how many times (laughs) that, that I've seen that show up in validation errors because people are on their devices and it's hard to type the same password, especially a complex Mm -hmm. one twice in a row on the chiclet keyboard. This is especially where the uh, having the label above the field will matter because you have very little uh, horizontal screen real estate on mobile, unlike on desktop where it's the opposite. Yeah. So those are our bits of advice. I hope those make your form better. Go check out the articles. We're going to have a bunch of them in the show notes. They have a lot of different um, examples. Be sure to check out the stuff on whether or not validation in line is good or bad and whether or not... Um, uh, the other thing is good or bad. What was the other one I said? Oh, uh, whether or not form length <laughs> oh, is good or bad. The thing we literally yeah. just talked about. <laughs> yeah, this is, what, what, what can I say? I took a trip to the uh, a, a trip to the Isle of Jura. Uh, anyway, <laughs> stick with us. We'll be back in about sixty seconds, and we will get you out of here. The Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at New Cloud. NewCloud is an industry-leading interactive map provider who has been building location-based solutions for organizations for a decade. 
Are you trying to find a simple solution to provide your users with an interactive map of your school, city, or business? Well, New Cloud's interactive map platform gives you the power to make and edit a custom interactive map in just minutes. They have a team of professional cartographers who specialize in map illustrations of many different styles and are ready to design an artistic rendering to fit your exact needs. One map serves all of your users' devices with responsive maps that are designed to scale and blend in seamlessly with your existing website. To request a demonstration or to view their portfolio, visit them online at newcloud.com slash drunkenUX. That's nucloud.com slash drunkenUX. Well, thanks for being with us this evening on episode number 29 of the Drunken UX Podcast. If you want to follow up with us, let us know your thoughts. Let us know what you think or anything you found that it works well for you on forums. Be sure to let us know. You can catch us on Twitter or Facebook slash Drunken UX, on Instagram at slash Drunken UX Podcast, or hit us up in our chat. We are drunkenux.com slash Slack. It'll drop you right in there, and anybody is welcome to join us anytime. Yes, please. Uh, what else do we got? <laughs> Heck, I don't know. Uh, got RT. What's the schedule for RTO now? I know we've only doing it in a month. It's- Wednesdays? Every other Wednesday? The RTO is ever is going to be every other Monday in between shows. We okay. did do it through January. It is coming, I swear. I yeah. it, ge- January was a really busy <laughs> month for us, so uh, <laughs> be on the lookout for that on alternating Mondays. Uh, build process uh, coming up with uh, Curtis Gramala is going to be coming up here this February. And nice. uh, the only other thing I guess I got left to say is just keep your personas close, folks, and your users closer, and build some cool forms. Bye-bye. <laughs> See ya. Yeah,